Hello. <laughs> Welcome back to hey, another hey, hey. podcast. Welcome back, dear listeners. Uh, so this week we're going to keep it sh- fairly short and simple, kind of a hiatus week where we're just going to talk about some medieval trivia, fun facts, false yeah, facts, keep you sort of thing. Yeah. But before we forget, we were doing so well. <laughs> I'm Elo and... Yeah, and I'm Megan, and <laughs> this is Modern Medieval, the podcast, home for all your fun crossover medieval, medievalism, pop culture, etc. cetera. Um, and Elo, did you know that this week with our last episode, we crossed over the 1,000 listen mark? Oh my god, no! Yeah. Hey, you sneaky, sneaky person. You didn't tell me <laughs> like 15 seconds ago. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Well done us. Thank you for yeah. listening. Thank you, listeners. Yeah, so I think we have 16 episodes at the moment. Something around that. And we're at, last I checked, 1,017 listens. So thank that's you, amazing. thank you. That's incredible. Yeah, for a little, you know, side project that more than anything is just for us to meet up and chat about something and have yeah, some structure in our lives. Exactly. That It's nice to know there are a few people out there listening that aren't just my dad. Dad, I love you. Thank you for <laughs> YouTubing and listening online. <laughs> it's much appreciated. I'm thinking yeah. of like a number one fan shirt or something. Yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, aside from that, we're just trucking along, you yeah. know, good old day. So, Ello, why don't you start us off today? And just for our audience who knows really quickly, we haven't shared our facts. So, hopefully there's not overlap. Much crossover, yeah. We'll find out. So, but any responses by the other co-host who's listening is all a... Genuine, natural. organic, natural response. <laughs> okay, so the first one. So, did you know that in the Middle Ages, the church didn't conduct witch hunts? Which I knew, because mm-hmm. obviously witch hunts um, started in the 16th and 17th century. These became more widespread in German-speaking lands in the 15th century though so kind of a bit of a crossover but what's interesting about this is that that's an assumption that people would have about the middle ages that you know witch hunt would be part of that culture Mm -hmm. um so i thought that was quite interesting and actually um apparently in the churches of the middle ages the main message was that magic was a foolish nonsense nonsense that didn't work which I thought was interesting as well, because obviously, again, it goes back to our whole um, perception of the Middle Ages and, you know, what we attribute to that period and how they behaved and how they thought. So I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, definitely. It is something that, so I knew that as well. The Inquisition in that era are definitely much more when the church is at like peak, peak power and yeah. kind of like their reign of terror, if you will. Yeah, um, I know it's, uh, that's a French Revolution epoch, yeah. but just kind of saying that that was when the church was doing a lot of the torture that we kind of agree As- associate with them. Yeah, yeah, that barbaric medieval. And you might be thinking, like, oh, what about Joan of Arc? You know, she was burned at the stake as a witch. So she was um, the 1420s, 1430s. So this is early 15th century. So what you were saying, Ello, is quite in line to talking about the 15th century, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So, I mean, she died in Rouen, 1431. Yeah. But another part of, like, her whole trial was also because she attested to hearing saints and archangels and having visions from God and kind of being um, a human soldier for God. So that was an issue, as well as her cross-dressing. So the way that she presented as a man for ease of riding horses and, you know, being a leader. So that was also a really a big point of contention. So I just bring her up because we think, oh, well, she was a witch, but that was mixed in with all these other things and it yeah. wasn't the sole reason. Yeah. It's kind of over time that's become the more like cultural reception. Yeah. But I mean, as well, you know, we, we view this past in a certain way. So anything that breaks away from that is seen as a bit of a surprise. 
Right. Definitely. So no, that's a great one to like start us off with because like Disney films, you know, that we've talked about and other works, they oftentimes place the witchcraft in the middle ages and that no time middle ages or Arthurian times, which of course that does have witchcraft, but that is Celtic tradition witchcraft, which is very, it's, it's a bit different yeah. than the Eurocentric, yeah, Germanic, Italian, etc. So fun, fun, fun. fun. Facts. My first fun fact trivia, um, Ello, is did you know that in the Middle Ages, eels were sometimes used as currency? No, I didn't. That's so cool. Yeah, so um, there are lots of records actually that survive showing people paying their rent in eels rather than um, money. Once there was a um, land in the Fenlands that was rented for 26,275 eels. And if you're, you know, interested in this, there's a really phenomenal person on Twitter called the Surprised Eel Historian. And their handle is at Green Lee JW. And they have become an eel historian. They have a really wonderful episode on the medievalists.net podcast where he goes on and actually talks with their host, Danielle Sabolski, about how he kind of fell into becoming an eel historian because he started off as a cartographer in London in the early modern times and saw this, a lot of eels showing up in the records and rents being paid in eels and other things. And he just got fascinated and dove into this. And I do recommend that episode on the podcast because it's so fascinating. And actually, eels were very, very popular until about the 1600s when we had, really? um, or at least in the UK, when there were the wars between the lowlands in Europe. So, you know, like Belgium and the Netherlands, because that was like where the trade was going and where we got a lot of the eels as well as from like the Mediterranean and then when the wars and tensions occurred then, you know, eel trade was cut off for about 10 years. So eel cuisine kind of stopped and it just didn't really have a revival. But yeah, I mean, eels can get quite large and they can be quite meaty. And yeah, you can dry it. You can make soup out of it, you know, like lots of just crazy things. So paying in it was actually like paying in food, you know, how sometimes people paid in flour or grain with what your trade. So yeah, eels were one. That's so cool. I also kind of think it's, it's really fascinating because obviously like the world of academia is filled with really e eccentric people who find certain something super interesting and they do tons of research. And I would never have thought of doing any kind of research on eels. So it's really, it's really like, it's, it's such a pearl, it's such a gem. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, this historian, I can't recall their like full name. It's like John something. Right. Um, but I, I, I apologize. I don't remember. But when he's telling his story, because looking on the maps and he was seeing the ships, you know, in the harbor on these maps that were eel ships. And that was his initial question was like, why are these on maps? Like, why are That's these here? So cool. And then trying to do research and there really wasn't any. And he kind of fell down this rabbit hole. And he, I mean, he talks about that. He's like, I never thought that I would be the eel person. But now he's like the world eel expert in history. And it's I mean, oh, he's we very, should try to get him on the show. Um, <laughs> maybe. But he's very well articulated. But I do love that he's kind of constantly in awe or like shock and kind of bemused about where the life that he has developed in <laughs> academia. But it's not a bad thing. You know, it's no, allowed no. him to do what he loves but yeah he's like I know a lot about eels and recipes and I think he's tried some of them and he's like yeah you don't really want to try this but this one's okay um well in Japan eel is a very um sought out fish yeah no I mean and yeah like, it's unagi I've still I've had eel I've had eel yeah. at, like sushi and everything but I mean peasants up to the the kings and queens ate eels and like all fuck ton of them like at feasts there would be like a thousand eels or something like this is something that was everywhere yeah and like eel soup so yeah it's yeah, not it's really getting... interesting well thank you for telling me that i've learned something new today yeah so... um, i'm going to bed a little bit less dumb <laughs> uh ella what's your next 
little tidbit. Oh, okay. This one, I think, is quite revolutionary to me. <laughs> okay, let's hear um, it. Again, as a contrast from what we expect the Middle Ages to be like, mm-hmm. um, people could actually vote. Um, so this is especially the case in France mm-hmm. in the 12th and 13th century, where people could, uh, men, sorry, men in towns and villages could vote at local level because those communities were run like a commune. Mm-hmm. And there were often annual elections for consuls and councillors where most male inhabitants could vote. Of course, it's important to note that they could not vote for a national or representat- representative government, but that that kind of thing existed, which I thought was really fascinating because obviously, you know, in the way that we perceive history in ancient Greece, you had like this kind of perfect idyllic at least in how I learned history, you have this perfect mm-hmm. idyllic space and then the Middle Ages, so everything is rough and confusing and bemusing and then you go back to the Renaissance and everything changes again. So again, that I'm constantly bringing it back to where we've always been um, by bringing this fact in, but I thought it was quite interesting. Yeah, um, definitely. It defies that Dark Ages trope. Yeah, yeah I don't think I knew that. I kind of feel like I did, but like I couldn't just point to it and be like, yeah, in this case or whatnot. And it really just just kind of shows that ideas like republics and democracy and whatnot don't just die or come out of a vacuum. Yeah. It's not like, you know, the Roman Empire fell and then the world went dark for a couple hundred years. Yeah. And then the Renaissance emerged out of nothing. Yeah. Like that's not how it works. It reminds me of one of the readings we did either for um, our general course or for Bob Mm -hmm. about how like it was talking about arches and the way certain arches came about and how we mistakenly believe that certain arches, like the way that churches were built, stopped changing during the Middle Ages. And then there was this resurgence in, in the Renaissance, but actually that there was kind of like a progression into that kind of architecture i'll try and think of the name because this is quite vague but um it's quite interesting because it's not the way that you expect it to be are you thinking of just like high gothic architecture like with the yeah cathedrals? i think i am and yeah how we got like flying buttresses and yeah. vaulted roofs yes that's the one um yeah and like the development of the pointed arch which had been based off of certain ideas from like the Roman era and the keystone stone but yeah it is always quite kind of curious how you go to somewhere I don't know like Notre Dame because that's just the first that pops into your head when you think of gothic cathedral and yes it did look radically different when it was first starting and throughout the centuries has changed but um cathedrals didn't just come out of nowhere and you really associate them with the Middle Ages. But then, yeah, it's forgotten that, oh, there's like maths and architecture and physics involved with all of this. And those are generally ideas that are late Renaissance to early modern and like Enlightenment times. And it's like, no, no, this was all around. It was or all in the happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you can't build something not even as grand, you know, as like Notre Dame or, you know, Westminster Abbey or something like that. Even more quote unquote simple buildings still have incredibly complex architecture. Yeah. Yeah. um, And thinking. Exactly. So that's a, that's a good one. Voting very in tune, you know, what's going on in America right now and all the votes becoming like official state by state, like the official counts coming through. I always just find it really interesting, you know, the idea that America is the country of democracy. That's kind of like what it was established by, right? Was this idea of escaping monarchy or other elements of rule, particularly in Western Europe, and going to like a free land where you can have democratic values. But first of all, America is a democratic republic. Yeah. So it's not a complete democracy because if it was, then the 2016 election would have been different because Hillary Clinton, who ended up losing due to the Electoral College, had two or three million more votes, which, yeah, in a democracy, the people speak, not the government. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just like, oh, it seems like such a brand new, bright idea. And I guess it was just approaching that idea in 
a different way or practicing it in a different way. Yeah. I mean, of course, the monarchy also had very different um, influence during the 16th, 1700s in the Middle Ages. But yeah, just how time ripples. and Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> I guess I'll just stick with like my animal theme. Did you know, Elo, that in the Middle Ages, animals could be tried as criminals? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there are records of animals being taken to court for killing people as well as smaller crimes. Examples include mice having been publicly tried for stealing part of the harvest, and a swarm of locusts being convicted for eating the crops. Um, I I think that's amazing, given that it actually speaks a million to how um, advanced they were. Because nowadays, you know, going on a bit of an environmental rant, um, right. But, you know, we don't, we're so disconnected from nature mm-hmm. that like a lot of us don't really know anything about how crops are grown, what agriculture is and what like animal rights should be put in place and how to respect animals and how to eat consciously and conscientiously. And like the fact that in the Middle Ages, they tried these animals as if, you know, they had responsibility that they should take. is is yeah. I, I, I'm all people. for it. <laughs> yeah, and one final example is, so in 1457, so this is late Middle Ages, but in Savigny, France, a sow, so a female pig, was charged with murder, found guilty, and hanged. <laughs> so, or perhaps I should say sow. <laughs> um, it's also kind of something to think about in the way that you're saying, Ella, but also the way that homes, especially like agricultural and farming homes were laid out, oftentimes there was one room in the house that held a lot of the animals, like the pigs right. and the cow, yeah. goats. And then in the room next door was like the quote unquote home, which had like the hearth and beds. So they, it was very close, intimate living proximity. So I wonder if, you know, sometimes the animals were considered more like family members and kind of that anthropomorphizing of the animals. I have no idea. That's just a a guess. Well, I mean, in Italy, for example, in my region, um, you would have these countryside houses where the bottom floor was for the animals and the top floor Mm. was for the um, farmers. And actually, it's true that that region has a very good grasp of you know what crops there are throughout the year and how to cook animals and how what relevance they have to agriculture so it's perhaps a tradition that was lost in some regions and not others maybe I don't know yeah it's just curious and I just think it's funny too because it also just brings to question like what is the line between man and animal in a very like metaphysical ontological kind of way and it also just makes me think a bit of like animal farm even though it's not communism but yeah the tables were reversed I don't want to get like super deep on it but I just I think that is I guess kind of more of like a quote-unquote quintessential medieval thing of like haha they like put a pig on trial it it, 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 like it seems absurd but metaphorically you could cross that over into lots of different things Yeah, and in fact, we've done three or four out of the top of our heads. Yeah, and it also makes me think of that Black Mirror episode in the first season with the Prime Minister and the pig and the blackmail episode, Uh, and he has to do the lewd act with the pig on national television. Um, But it kind of springs to mind that as well. Yeah. So Good stuff. All right, Elo. So I've got two more. Okay, great. This one, to me, just because of the visual imagery, was kind of surprising, but actually makes sense. Okay. Uh, most great medieval authors didn't write, so they would have a scribe often writing for them, mm. which is quite interesting, because obviously, in the way that it is filmed today, the Middle Ages, you'd often associate like clergymen writing, rewriting, and being scribes, but you wouldn't really that's the kind of imagery that you associate to it and also like visually you have like obviously like the manuscripts and how those are represented and so I thought that was quite like a slightly surprise it doesn't actually surprise me but I wouldn't have thought of it by myself if that that makes sense 
yeah, it's something we just take for granted that yeah. literacy and part of literacy is not just reading, but writing. And because I don't know if there's a word for like being able to write, but not read because I think they're quite, car- no, cartomancy is reading cards. Anyways, I don't know. But yeah, yeah. that's, yeah, that's, I don't think I've ever really considered it in that vein. But yeah, that is quite interesting, interesting. right? Yeah, it's a good one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other like thoughts on that one? Or I feel like. Um, no, not really. I thought it was just yeah, quite same. random. <laughs> it's random. And I think it's just one where you're kind of like, yeah, that huh. makes sense. And yeah. then <laughs> it's like, okay. Because yeah, I think a lot of people are aware that population wise literacy and being able to like read and write comes around much more towards the industrial revolution. Of course, the Gutenberg press helped, but that still took time and a couple centuries until it became much more easily accessible to not just wealthy individuals. So, okay. Well, I have one that is definitely more of a British medieval one, but I think it's interesting. But did you know that in the Middle Ages, swans were exclusively game for the rich? No. So today, the royal swans are strictly off limits. They're kind of like nationally protected birds that belong to the crown. They are like sovereign, right? Sovereign swans. <laughs> um, but yeah, in the Middle Ages, they were a delicacy of the upper classes, and there were recipes including roasted swan in entrail sauce, Christmas swan pie, and roast signet stuffed with beef. Which signet is the babies, not mm. like a signet ring. I don't know if they have a relationship or not. But I don't know. Um, and then at this time, you know, because the cuisine was a bit different, menus also included peacocks, turtle doves, cranes, storks, sparrows, herons, and blackbirds. They also, I think, ate squirrel on occasion. And there were some other cuisine that, yeah, we're like, oh, I wouldn't eat that today. No. Like I know that pigeons won, and I know some places still eat pigeon. And when I was doing my research, when I was in Edinburgh, and I was reading like um, a general history of Poland. So all the way from the beginning till the 1980s, it was talking about, you know, like pigeon for meals. And it, I remember for me, that was a like, what? Because okay. in America, they're just rats on wings. So yeah. I like <laughs> couldn't picture eating a pigeon. Well, I think in France, they still eat them, right? Yeah, like it's still a cuisine, just like how, you know, horse is still eaten in parts of France and considered like a quality, your upper echelon, upper end meat. Yeah. It's not like a delicacy per se, but it's yeah. up there. Yeah, I mean, my the one I know about that I've always found kind of shocking is turtles. So turtles, people ate them until like up to 50 years ago. And since then, it's become illegal and it's actually yeah. really dangerous. You shouldn't eat turtles because... They've been alive for a very long time, so they have a ton of um, bad stuff in their blood. So mm. it's actually not very good for you. It's kind of like with big tuna. You wouldn't really want a, an adult tuna that's lived for like 20 years because it's got like a ton of mercury and sh- stuff like that in it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, it just came in. <laughs> but yeah, just like the swans. Because like, I've heard it, you know, like Christmas swans and everything. But yeah, the fact that it was like, if you were a peasant or a lower class citizen and like killed a swan that could be a like a legal offense like you're not allowed and I just think that that is like oh what do you do as a profession I'm the swan police like I don't I guess we have things that are equivalent to that today but I just I found that interesting and also I never want to try roasted swan in entrail sauce that sounds zero percent yeah um no thanks to be honest (laughs) I'm kind of going off meat so like things I used to get yeah, because I was gonna say oh well it might be like duck, but like at the moment duck sounds a bit disgusting to me so Fair. <laughs> I don't know. I um, do love duck personally. I, I used to love it too. Since the summer, I've just yeah, it's yeah. just stopped being as appealing. Fair enough. It's good for yeah. the environment. Yeah, yeah. So Ella, why don't you share with us your last? Yeah, so this one actually, I thought, went hand in hand with how we perceive the Middle Ages, or at least how I tend to think of things. So if you wanted to get married in the Middle Ages, you didn't have to get married in church. Kind of goes hand in hand with like the pagan perception that we have of the Middle Ages. 
um, and the kind of village perception of it. Those who wanted their marriage solemnized would usually do so at the gate of the churchyard, which I thought was quite interesting. But actually to get married, all you had to do was vow to the other person that you wanted to marry them. It was better if you had witnesses with you, but you because I think perception was that God was omnipresent, you didn't need to be in that space for it to be sacred, which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah, it was just like a, a certain phrase of words that you both had to say back to one another. Yeah. One of the episodes on the Medievalists podcast, they like talk about this. And I guess one of the questions they had to ask you before you got married, if you got married in a church, was have you previously said these vows? Because you could, like, unknowingly marry someone, even yeah. if you, like, didn't live together. Like, if you were drunk or delirious or something, or even joking around, which, yeah, is vastly different than, A, how marriage is today, and B, how you would think marriage would be in the Middle think, Ages. Yeah. Especially because, like, doesn't Romeo and Juliet take place in, like, 1405 or something like that? Like, with Shakespeare? I think so. Because he set a lot of his plays in Middle Ages, not yeah. his contemporary time. So it's just kind of funny because imagine if that was like how that plot played out rather than them going to the monk and trying to like secretly wed and vow one another. And then, you know, the tragic ending. Yeah. They could have just set it out the window. So like rather than, you know, what's in a name and blah, 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 blah. It would just been like... I take the Romeo to be yeah. my husband. And then like vice versa. And I've been like, oh, well, they're married now. Suck it. Yeah. <laughs> Mom and dad. Yeah. Um, well, so in Saudi, this is not very funny, but um, in Saudi to divorce someone, all you have to, the husband has to tell the wife that he divorces her three times in a row for it to be the law. That's not very good. But that was the only thing that came to mind when, <laughs> when we were speaking about this. Yeah. <laughs> I bet a lot of people that are not in Saudi feel that, that they wish they could have their divorces be like that rather than having to go through to fight it out, court yeah. lawyers. And yeah. it's really, I find it like amazing. This is a bit of a, a rant or, but kind of thinking out loud as well, but what like repetition of phrases does. Yeah. So especially in like urban legends and even like witchcraft, mm -hmm. you know, stories, but you know, like the first one that pops into my mind is Bloody Mary. Where if you say Bloody Mary, oh my God, there's three scare me or, so much. You know, five times in the mirror, she appears. And it's like that that sense of repetition. And, you know, in church, there's repetition of certain phrases to kind of call the presence of God. And so yeah, this like repetition of like I divorce you, and you say it three times. Or like even Wizard of Oz, you know, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And it's curious, like, yeah, what just repetition, I guess that kind of like cosmic or it's not primal, but like supernatural or preternatural, extra natural, I don't know, energy or force, magnetism, whatever, there's something there. It's kind of like rhyming when you're like satisfied, yeah. when you have, you know, a A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D rhyme rather than sometimes like free verse where it's like a semi-rhyme, maybe. If yeah. you had like a light rhyme, you're kind of like, oh, I wish that this would have rhymed. Sorry, that was just a rant, but I just, it's interesting. It is really interesting. I'm also oh, agree. quite grateful that, you know, you can't unintentionally marry people really today, unless you go to like Vegas. And even then you have to go through like a ceremony. I mean, yeah, they cost money and can be a faff, even going to the courthouse. But imagine how many like little kids would accidentally marry each other. Or like teenagers with their first love. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, still an interesting fact. I guess I'm a spoil sport because I, I knew that. But a wow. better audience won't. And we'll be like, what? <laughs> um, no, no, it's fine. I mean, some of these, you know, it's always filling in the blanks of the things you don't know with the things that you thought you knew. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, so I'm just kind of looking at some of the other facts I have, and I'm trying to think of a good one to end on. Um, let's see. We can talk about not being dirty and cleanliness is next to godliness, if we want to think about that and how it's actually like Renaissance era where public baths went into decline and like Protestant re revolution where people stopped bathing as much. Hmm. Misconception. I know that. Or I think quite a lot of people know that gargoyles were either added to buildings posthumously, you know, like 19th century Notre Dame yeah. the gargoyles, or that they're originally just made as water pipes. 
to yeah. take water off buildings. Uh, people in the Middle Ages had savings accounts. So it's not just capitalism. Yeah, according to this, um, the Middle English term pig, P-Y-G-G, mm. referred to a type of clay with which jars or pots were made. Pig jars were used for saving coins and by the 18th century were known as pig banks or piggy banks. That's where Ooh. piggy bank comes from. Well, there we go. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Well, that's, the, that's the one to end on, I think. Yeah, well, I guess there's one more. It's pig related. I guess I'm just the pig lady today. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of sad, but you know how today like people want to buy pigs, like teacup pigs or micro pigs, mini pigs, and they're constantly duped because they don't exist. And they mm. always turn into, like, large pigs. Too. Yeah. Like, I follow one on t- Instagram. It's called Esther the Wonder Pig. And this family adopted her thinking she was going to stay cute and, like, small piggy forever. And she started to grow. And she's, like, huge now. I mean, like, the size of a goat or bigger, but, like, pig. So pig-shaped and large. And, I mean, I think pigs are super cute regardless. But um, she got adopted by these people who have started a sanctuary. And she's treated so well but um in the middle ages micro pigs did exist did they but this is because medieval farm animals were so undernourished and so small that a full-grown bull was around the size of a modern calf and sheep were only a third of the size they are today while modern sheep yield around 7.3 pounds of wool medieval fleece yields were sometimes less than one pound per animal and then with pigs there were some that were so small they were the size of medium-sized dogs today so that's because i didn't know that people were hungry they weren't fed like the piggy banks <laughs> hopefully um oh and one one sorry one one last one this is, just, <laughs> this is this is this is a bonus one because i think this is just like kind of funny did you know that hallucinogenic bread existed in the middle ages no but i'm not surprised um so apparently summer you know is difficult and people ran out of grain before the new crop could be harvested. Right. So they would resort to old rye to make their bread. Unfortunately, stored rye could become infected with ergot, a fungus that caused hallucinations, gangrene, and even death. No way. So I guess <laughs> for our people living in America, especially in, um, is it Oregon or Washington? Or is it Colorado? Be thankful that, you know, your hallucinogenic mushrooms, your magic mushrooms won't poison you, but make sure you're cautious if you purchase them and don't get the ones that'll kill you. you know? That's an excellent note to yeah. end on, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be poisoned to death. Yeah, I think that was like a fun just share along. Yeah. Tune in next week with us. Yeah, hopefully um, we'll have a guest. And if not, yeah, we'll should be quite exciting. Be something nice. We are entering into the holiday season, so... Probably be getting ready. a bit more festive with that church things, as we've mentioned. With what is it? The, not the hollow season. All Souls and All Saints ushers it in, and it. Oh, do you remember what it was called? Hello, Hello Tide. That's what yeah. it's called. And yeah. just briefly to the American listeners, happy upcoming Thanksgiving. Hooray! Be thankful for your health and your family during this pandemic. And I guess this can just go to anyone and everyone, even if you don't celebrate. And then for Americans, let's try not to celebrate, you know, um, genocide and (laughs) land stealing and other things. Just be grateful for kindness and happiness and health. And even though 2020 has been a shit year, you know, the, the, the good things in life, even if they're small. I agree. So, hello. You can find us. Mm-hmm. on spotify apple podcast audible and amazon by typing modern medieval podcast you can also find us on social media on instagram by typing podcast.modern.medieval you can find us on youtube for more episodes just by typing modern medieval podcast you can find us via email by typing modern.medieval.podcast at gmail.com we've got a facebook page and group just type modern medieval podcast and finally twitter yes twitter 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 tweet tweet twitter our handle is at medieval underscore modern you can contact us there so as always share your thoughts questions, comments, a praise for us. Um, Ello, I forgot to mention this is in regard to our YouTube. Someone sent a message or a comment, a comment on one of our videos, the Morbid and Macabre episode. And they said, just discovered this. Thanks so much. I'm really enjoying this. And then they're also like, I really appreciate the Oingo Boingo reference. 
So it felt Ooh. nice that someone like well, got a reference you, in there. <laughs> so yes, thank you. I did reply and say thank you. And um, so yeah, we want more of that. It's like a highlight of our day. It makes us feel seen and heard quite literally. Thank you so much for listening to us. <laughs> thank you. Ramble on. Until next time, I'm Megan. And I'm Elo. And this is Modern Medieval, the podcast. Do, 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 do. <laughs>